Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for your word that you've given us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that you came because you loved us. And Lord, the amazing thing, you love us still. And so, Lord, thank you. Lord, as we open your word, I just ask, Lord, that you would guide us through it. Help us to find the application that we need for our lives. Help us to see you in this word. Help us to understand, Lord, the difficult times of our lives and what that means to you and what we're supposed to do in the midst of those and how we can actually honor you even more when things are tough. And so we give you glory and honor this morning. And we do so in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So you can open with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you're visiting this morning, we uh, move through the scriptures systematically. We're going through Galatians on Wednesday night, just in the early parts of that, as well as the early parts of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, challenging study. Um, as we've talked about for the last two Sundays, written by Solomon, the wisest of men to live, who had observed a lot of things about life on this earth and saw some of the futility or much of the futility in the things that we do. And I want to keep emphasizing that as we go through this book, it's not to depress us. It's not to make us hopeless. It's to see what life is like when there is not a divine perspective, when there's no hope of eternity. You know, and many have questioned whether Solomon was okay with God by the time he got to his finish line in his earthly life. And I think if you listen today, you're going to see that he was probably in a good place. But he's sharing what he saw. He's sharing what he experienced. He's sharing what he understood with all his wisdom and unfortunately with the overwhelming material wealth that he had and some of the mistakes he made in that. Let's take a look at verse 1. We're going to spend quite a bit of time just in this verse. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I almost was going to bring up the musical score for this that runs through our heads. The Birds, 1965. I felt like Dick Clark when I said that. Some of you probably are not old enough to know who Dick Clark is. But they made, you know, it was interesting because in that time frame, there were several scriptural songs. Within the reg, you know, within popular music, um, not so much anymore. So there's some really important things for us to consider in this verse and the following verses. The opening eight verses of this chapter really provide us an opportunity to consider God's sovereignty, and I think that's particularly important in the days we find ourselves. To know that He truly is sovereign, that He's truly in charge, that he truly is this moment sitting on the throne of heaven. And we need to know that because sometimes it can look like maybe not. And there's those that would challenge us and say, well, he isn't. I mean, look at the conditions of our world. And he must have taken his hand off. And I don't believe that, and neither should you. But I think the importance here is for us to consider the events in our own lives in the context of God being the author of all things, the author of everything. And Solomon says, for everything, there is a season. Now, what's that word season mean to us? How do we understand that word season? Well, the word they chose to use there, it means an appointed occasion, an appointed time. You could even say a fixed occasion or fixed time. And we're also told there that these appointed times have purpose. That's good to know. It's good to know that there's always a purpose behind what's happening, and the purpose belongs to God himself. So we could ask this question, so which comes first, the season or the purpose? I believe the purpose is the catalyst for the seasons. God determines purpose for our lives and in our lives, in order for his purposes to manifest, though, 
He causes or allows circumstances, which they call here seasons, to facilitate the outcome that he desires. So the question that we need to wrestle with this morning is this. What do we do with the season or seasons in which we find ourselves? Or perhaps the first question should be, do we see our circumstances as seasons? I think there's a huge amount of relief in this chapter if we can grasp what God is showing us here. If we can understand our times as seasons. And not only seasons, but seasons with a purpose. But, you know, before we try to answer these questions, we need to understand what is meant by purpose. It's actually quite interesting. The Hebrew word used here and translated as purpose means pleasure. Whose pleasure? God's pleasure. If we can understand that, we move up another notch towards hope. Because there are seasons in our life where we can't find reasons for what we're going through. And we would not call those moments pleasurable. But the fact is the very word that the Holy Spirit gave to the author here is that exact word. So it's not about us finding pleasure in our circumstances. It's about us being able to give pleasure in our circumstances to God himself. That may be a new thought. If it's a new thought, then hallelujah, hold on to it. If it's a reminder, hallelujah, hold on to it. Whether it's new or old, we need to be reminding each other of that fact as we go through trials. So the picture we're given here in this verse is one of God appointing times or seasons for his pleasure or purpose. I mean, let that sink in. Our every circumstance whether easy or difficult, is a season created or allowed by God during which we have the opportunity to bring him pleasure. Wow. That's all I can say about that. So let's pretend for a moment we've come to that point. Because I don't know, maybe you've come to that point. I will not swear to that. And then if we come to that point, we'll see every circumstance in our life as a God-provided season. And as such, our heart will follow and will desire to bring God pleasure. But where do we start? Where do we start? What does that even look like? Maybe some of you would wonder, well, where do we get our answer? We go and we ask, what does God's word tell us? Paul in Romans Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So where do we start? We start by looking at our circumstance, by looking at the season we're in, and be willing to sacrifice how we might respond to this for how God will respond to it. We're putting ourselves where we should be, second, third, fourth, last, compared to God as our priority. Now we find out here God's will is perfect. And if it's his will, either by cause or allowance, that we have these seasons, then we have to believe that God's seasons are perfect. There's no mistakes. We're not in a circumstance by circumstance. And in that season, we have the opportunity to prove that his will or season is good, acceptable. What's acceptable mean? Well-pleasing. There's that pleasing again. Well-pleasing for us, not necessarily, unless it's some super positive event, but well-pleasing to him. And perfect. Perfect means complete. So we need to step back from the circumstance and say, okay, I'm in this season now because God's caused it or allowed it. And in that season, no matter what it looks like, I have the opportunity to bring him pleasure by how I choose to respond. 
That's a perspective change. That's a paradigm shift that really changes the whole ballgame of how we look at things that are happening. I think it also tells us something else, that we're not to be praying always necessarily, and you may disagree with me, for peace. I mean, that's not saying you can't pray for peace. But sometimes in the midst of something, instead of praying our way out of it, we need to pray for what's going on in it. Because in my experience, if I don't, I'll be in it again sometime later. Now, the tricky part is this. We often encounter these seasons without warning. We find ourselves in a season without a broad enough vantage point to know exactly where the road is going or where it's going to end. But that's where faith comes in. And that's a huge issue. And I've talked about this before. It's a huge issue. And you know how I know it's a huge issue? Because Jesus addressed it often. He addressed unbelief often. And as I've said half-jokingly many times, if you want to offend a fellow Christian, just ask them about their faith. If Jesus was bold enough and right enough as God himself to say to someone, it's about your unbelief, then maybe we should consider that that could be an area we need to tighten up. Because we're to walk by faith, not by sight. And what does our faith do for God? Well, now listen, it pleases him. It pleases him. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's one of those great verses that is sort of a formula, the way I look at it. To have faith and to please him, we need to believe that he is. That's a very interesting phrasing in the English, that he is. But when you look into the definition of how of the, in the Greek and take it back to the Hebrew, it really comes back to what God said of himself, I am. We need to believe that he is the I am, that he is. Because once we believe that, then we have the foundation we need to move forward in faith. Because if God is who he says he is, How shall I not have faith in him? And yet so many don't, because it's a choice. And some might ask this, is it really, is it really, should it really be our focus to please God? Is that something, is that an effort we should have as a priority? Well, you may ask that, but here's what I know. Jesus thought it was important. In John chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus says, He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. And what did he do? He did what he was told. He was obedient. And his obedience led to his Father in heaven being pleased. So our opening verse this morning reminds us that God is the one who appoints each moment. You know, the Bible describes God as all-powerful, all-knowing. We see that in the Psalms, 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord, mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Word also tells us He's outside of time. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting, you are God. And we know that God is the author of all creation. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. So nothing in all creation occurs without God's permission. God has the power and knowledge to prevent anything he chooses to prevent. Many, <clears throat> meaning anything that does happen must, at very least, be allowed by God. Even if he didn't cause it, he allows it. The opening verses of this chapter are meant to focus us on God's ultimate authority in heaven and on earth. Now, you know, when we consider how many things humans have mastered in this world, it's amazing. And yet some elements of our existence are beyond our control. For instance, we cannot conquer time. 
We're warned about time in the New Testament. Life is a combination of joy and sorrow, pleasure, pain, harmony, and struggle, life, death. Each and every season has its appropriate time in the cycle of life. And things constantly change. Our responsibility is to learn to accept and adjust to the ebb and flow of God's design. Now, some seasons are difficult, and we may not understand what God is doing. But during those times, we must humbly submit to the Lord's plans, trust that he is working it out for his good purposes and his pleasure, which takes us back to walking by faith, to walking in the spirit, which we're encouraged to do. Now let's pick up with those even more familiar verses, beginning in verse 2. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. And a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So there's 28 activities listed there. 14 sets of opposites. And all of them are the inevitable and nearly unavoidable events that cycle throughout every person's life. Now verse 2 there mentions the boundaries of every life. Every person is born, every person dies. Everything else that this poem records are the things in between those boundaries, in between birth and death. And there are joys listed here like healing and laughter, embracing love and peace. They're opposing things like mourning, hate, and war. All and each is an opportunity to see God's hand at work, to seek him in prayer, in praise, in desperation, and in worship. You know, I can't say for sure what was on the mind of Solomon as he wrote this, but it strikes me that these opposing events seem to cancel each other out. It's as if to say it's all a wash in the end. Everything is equaled out as the rain falls on the just and the unjust. There's good and there's bad. It's just the way, the way life is on this fallen earth. But as redeemed people, we need to have the right perspective in order to overcome that tough truth and not to end up despaired by it, not to end up depressed by it. We need to be able to say, but God. In the seventh chapter of this book of Ecclesiastes, the 14th verse, it says, in the day of prosperity, excuse me, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the the one as well as the other. So the good and the bad, all within the sovereignty of God. Is God evil? No. Does he allow evil for his own purposes? Yes. Does he allow pain into our lives? Yes. Can he cause pain in our lives? Yes. It all depends on what his will is. But if we don't see the pain, if we don't see the troubles, if we don't see the tribulations as an opportunity, We will always resent them and probably never learn whatever it is God's trying to teach us. Now, I just said something that you can remind me of. And it's something we need to remind each other of. In the bad times, what is God doing? How do we please him in that moment? How do we respond in a godly way in those moments? And it's no accident that we're studying this right now. Because we're looking at a world, we're looking at a country, we're looking at a state, and seemingly our city following, where we could forget this lesson. 
And we could just say, you know what, everything's just bad. And everything's just getting worse. And there's some truth to that. But what do I do in the midst of that? You know, God didn't say he would make you salt and light. He said once you were saved, you are salt and light. And so he wouldn't make you salt if the world didn't need flavoring. He wouldn't make you light if the world wasn't dark. And so we need to recognize how much he's empowered us, how he's placed us wherever we are to do the things that he's calling us to do. Look at verse 9. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? The question here lingering in Solomon's mind was, what lasting gain has the worker for all his toil? I mean, for every constructive activity, there seems to be a destructive one. And Solomon had asked this kind of question before, but this time he found an answer. He found an answer in the task that God gives to man. Let's look at that verse 10. He says, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So here's Solomon. He had conducted an exhausted review of all activities, employments, pursuits that God gave to man to occupy his time. He concluded that God made everything beautiful in its time. Said differently, there is an appropriate time or season for each activity. There's a sense of balance highlighted in the poetic list that began this chapter. Solomon considered the good and the bad and understood that God makes everything beautiful in its time. Paul reflected that in the book of Romans Chapter 8, verse 28, he said, And we know that all things work for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God makes everything beautiful for those who love him in time, when it's time, when it's his time. Always find that verse challenging, 828 of Romans, because it starts off with three very powerful words. And we know. Do we know? Because that's what we need to know in the midst of those seasons, the bad ones, the tough ones. That he's working all things for good, that he's making everything beautiful in its time. Also, God, Solomon tells us, has put eternity into the heart of man. Man lives in a world of time, but it has an awareness of eternity. Instinctively, man thinks forever, even though he cannot understand the concept. And we can say that eternity is in our hearts because we are made in the image of an eternal God. God has given man a longing for an awareness of eternity, but God hasn't revealed very much about his eternal work. But even though he hasn't revealed it, even though he's held back some of the things about it, this keeps us yearning for eternity. It keeps the idea alive in our hearts. Man eagerly waits what has not yet been fulfilled. So does creation. All of creation moans for that time where all things will be put right again. Everything will be made beautiful in its time, and it'll be the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. Look at verse 12. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear him before him. That which has already been and what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. So Solomon considers that man's life is governed by certain unalterable laws. And that all his activities seem to live, leave him where he started. So what's his conclusion? He decides that the best response is to be happy and enjoy life as much as possible. After all, as we've heard, God makes all things beautiful and places the gift of eternity in our hearts. So why not receive the good things of this life? 
receive them as the gift of God. Now, of course, as believers, we're also to understand limitations. We're to enjoy our life, but we're also to know what our limits are and be able to respond to the convictions that God brings into our hearts about the things that we do. So Solomon accurately perceives that God's decrees are unchangeable, unchallengeable. He says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. What God has decided will stand, and man cannot alter it, either by additions or subtractions. So that means God's actions are permanent. He says, it shall be forever. And God's actions are effective and complete. He says, nothing can be added to it. And God's actions are totally secure. Nothing can be taken from it. That's a security like none other. There's nothing else on this earth that can give us that kind of security. That's the type of assurance. So that means it would be foolish for creatures to fight against the arrangements of their creator. Now Solomon also notes, God does this that men should fear before him. Man fears before God knowing that he and he alone is in full control with power over all things, including life and death. So what do we conclude then? Well, it's much better to respect him and submit to his control. Solomon seems to briefly move away from his perspective of saying, under the sun. He stops that thinking for a moment, and his eyes move up to the heavens. And upon God, eternal. And he then gives a description of current events as simply the replay of things that have happened previously believing nothing will happen in the future but what has already been. So Solomon ends this portion of Scripture with eyes still above the sun. He says God requires an account of what is past. So he concludes that if God judges the heart and deeds of man, then everything has meaning. This makes me think. I thought about this a lot as I read this chapter and studied The despair Solomon writes about is more generally the despair of mankind than his own. I think we apply so much of this to him. And I'm not saying he didn't go through it because he's the one who experienced all these things. He definitely went through it. But I think this is him pulling back and speaking about the general condition of mankind. He was the keen observer, and then he serves in this book as the reporter. And what was he called at the very beginning of the book? The preacher. He's preaching this experience of his. And as little as you can find in there, it seems he's encouraging us. He's encouraging us towards a future, speaking of eternity. He's encouraging us towards a relationship with the one who creates every season that we're in. He's encouraging us to see every season that we're in, that it has a purpose. And that he's working all those purposes to good. So, I'm going to say, and you don't have to agree with me, a lot of this despair is not his. But here's the thing we need to know. It doesn't need to be ours either. We have a choice. We always have a choice. God is sovereign, but yet there's a sovereignty of man because we have choices to make. We have free will. It's the one great freedom, liberty, that we have that some of us, if we were honest, would say, I wish it wasn't be a lot easier if you just made me do those things. But he doesn't do it that way. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his son to save us, that we would have that hope of eternity secure. And yet he loves us so much that he wants to be loved back by our own will to do so. And so we have the opportunity to do that in all seasons of our life. But we choose And I think the times we get ourselves in trouble is we say, well, I'll love him more when things are good. And we may not even say that out loud. We may not even know we're thinking that or that's what we're responding to. And yet sometimes it is really what guides our actions. And so as we watch what we're watching unfold in this world, these are the times we need to determine in our heart how we're going to respond when times get tougher and times get darker. 
because I promise you they are. But God, but God. And he's even given you a gift this morning of me finishing early. So you have even more reason to praise him. I was going to finish the chapter, but I thought, no, it's too long. Wow. Okay. Don't get used to it. So we'll move into our time of communion and ushers and worship and come back up. If you're visiting with us this morning, we take communion every Sunday. We just pass the cup and pass the bread, and we just ask that you would take it and spend some time, spend some personal time with the Lord. One, just with a heart of praise for the fact that he has saved you. And for anyone here this morning or listening to me later that can't claim that as ever happening, that you may be not sure if you're saved, maybe you know you're not saved. And maybe it's just been a life of searching and maybe church here and there or a Christian family that was good to you, but you never became yours. Then I'm just going to encourage you, you need Jesus. And he offers that free gift, but he paid a huge price for it. And that's what we come to the communion table to celebrate, that he laid down his body for us, that he bled for our forgiveness, and he did it willfully. He did it willfully. He determined in his heart to do his father's will. That was the season that he was in. And so we give him all honor and glory for that. And we do, Lord, give you all honor and glory. And we thank you. And Lord, I ask for each of us, Lord, that we would have the strength, Lord, to walk through the seasons of our lives with the knowledge that you've either given us new today or refreshed us with that we would see the opportunity to please our loving Heavenly Father. And you don't ask much, Lord, but then again, you ask everything. You just want our hearts. You want our obedience. You just want us to love you back. And you created us for that exact purpose. And so, Lord, we praise your holy name this morning. And, Lord, we ask, Lord, for the strength, as I said, to walk that obedient line so that we can experience all the good that you have for us, even in the bad times. So again, we give you all honor and glory, and we praise you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name.